Yeah. yeah. You were rumored to be one of the rescue buyers of long-term capital. What, what was the play there? What did you see? Well, there's a story in the current Fortune magazine, one has Rupert Murdoch's picture on the cover that tells the whole story of our involvement. It's, it's kind of an interesting story because I, I, well, I, it's, a, it's a long story, so I won't go into all the background of it, but I got the really serious call about long-term capital uh, probably, what, four weeks ago this Friday, whenever it was. It was my granddaughter. I got it in mid-afternoon, and my granddaughter was having her birthday party that evening, and then I was flying that night to Seattle to go on a 12-day trip with Gates on a, to Alaska and a private train, all kinds of things where I was really out of communication. But I got this call on a Friday afternoon saying that things were really getting serious there. I'd had some other calls before that the article gets into a few weeks earlier. I know those people, most of them pretty well. So a lot of them were at Solomon when I was there. And uh, the place was imploding. And the Fed was sending people up that weekend. And so between that Friday and the following Wednesday when the New York Fed, um, in effect, orchestrated a, a, a rescue effort, but without any federal money involved, uh, I was quite active, but I was having this terrible time because we were sailing up through these uh, through these canyons, which held no interest for me whatsoever in Alaska. And and the captain would say, you know, if we just steer over here, we might see some bears and whales. And I said, steer where you got a good satellite connection. Cause I want <laughs> <laughs> so so it was. Uh, in fact, there's a picture, unfortunately, where I've got my uh, old faithful is going off behind me, and I've got my back to it. I'm on the phone, which was the people in the group thought was kind of funny the way I was. <laughs> Working the phone, but we put in a bid on, on on Wednesday morning. I was by then I was in uh, Bozeman, Montana, and I talked to uh, Bill McDonough, the head of the New York Fed, about uh, about ten o'clock. They were having a meeting of the bankers at ten o'clock that morning in, in, in New York, and I caught him. Right, I, we actually delivered a message to him. He called me out there in Wyoming a little bit before ten New York time, and we made a bid. It was a it was uh, because it was being done at a long distance and everything it was really the outline of a bid but uh, in the end uh, it was a bid for 250 million essentially for the net assets of uh, but we would have put in three and three quarters billion on top of that and it would have been three billion from Berkshire Hathaway 700 million from AIG and 300 million from Goldman Sachs and we submitted that but we put a very short time fuse on it because when you're bidding on 100 billion dollars worth of securities that are moving around you don't want to leave a fixed price bid out there very long, plus we were worried about it getting shopped. Uh, in the end, they, they, the bankers made the deal. and uh, uh, But it was, an, it was an interesting period. The whole long-term capital management, and I hope most of you are familiar with it, but the, the whole story is really fascinating because if you take John Merriweather and Eric Rosenfeld, Larry Hillenbrand, Greg Hawkins, Victor Agani, the two Nobel Prize winners, Merton and Scholes, if you take the 16 of them, that, they probably have as high an average IQ as any 16 people working together in one business in the country, including at Microsoft or, or wherever you want to name. So an incredible amount of intellect in that room. Now you combine that with the fact that those 16 had had extensive experience in the field they were operating. I mean, this, this, this was not a bunch of guys who had made their money, you know, selling men's clothing and then all of a sudden went into the securities business or anything. They'd had They'd, they'd had, in aggregate, the 16 had probably had 350 or 400 years of experience doing exactly what they were doing. And then you throw in the third factor, that most of them had virtually all of their very substantial net worths in the business. So they had their own money up, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of their own money up, super high intellect, working in a field they knew, and essentially they went broke. And that, to me, is absolutely fascinating. I mean, I... I if, if I ever write a book, it's going to be called Why Smart People Do Dumb Things. Uh, my partner says that it should be autobiographical, but I. <laughs> but, but this might be an interesting illustration. And these are perfectly decent guys. I, you know, I, I, I respect them, and they helped me out when I was uh, had problems with Solomon. And so they're 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 not bad people at all. But to make money they didn't have and didn't need, they risked what they did have and did need. And that's foolish. That is just plain foolish. It doesn't make any difference what your IQ is. If you, if you risk something that is important to you for something that is unimportant to you, it just does not make any sense. I don't care whether the odds are 100 to 1 that you succeed or 1,000 to 1 that you succeed. If you hand me a gun with a 1,000 chambers, a million chambers in it, and there's a bullet in one chamber, and you said, put it up your temple, how much do you want to be paid to pull it once? 
I'm not going to pull it. You know, you can name any sum you want, but it doesn't do anything for me on the upside. And I think the downside's fairly clear. <laughs> so I'm not interested in that kind of a game. And yet people do it financially and without thinking about it very much. Uh, there was a great book. It wasn't a great book. It was a great title. It was a lousy book written once with a great title uh, by Walter Gutman. The title was You Only Have to Get Rich Once. Now, that seems pretty fundamental, doesn't it? What is... What difference, if you've got $100 million at the start of the year and you're going you're to make 10% if you're unleveraged and 20% if you're leveraged 99 times out of 100, what difference does it make at the end of the year whether you've got 110 million or 120 million? It makes no difference at all. I mean, if you, if you die at the end of the year, you know, the guy that writes up the story may make a typo and he may say 110 even if he had 120, so you've got nothing at all. You know, what, it, can't, it makes absolutely no difference. It makes no difference to your family, it makes no difference to anything. And yet, the downside, particularly managing other people's money, is not only losing all your money, but it's, it's disgrace and humiliation and, and facing friends whose money you've lost and everything. I, I, just, I just can't imagine an equation that that makes sense for. And yet 16 guys with very high IQs who are very decent people entered into that game. And, you know, I think it's madness. And it's, it's, it's produced by an over-reliance to some extent on things, you know, those guys would tell me back when I was at Solomon, you know, that a six sigma event wouldn't, you know, wouldn't wouldn't touch us, or a seven sigma event. But they were wrong. I mean, that their, their, their history does not tell you the probabilities of future financial things happening. And they had a great reliance on mathematics, and they felt that that the bait of the stock told you something about the risk of the stock. It doesn't tell you a damn thing about the risk of the stock, in my view. And uh, uh, and, and sigmas do not tell you about the risk of going broke, in, in my view, uh, and maybe in their view now too. Uh, but, but I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't like to even use them as an example because they are. I mean, the same thing in a different way could happen to any of us, probably, where we, where we really have a blind spot about something that's crucial because we know a whole lot about something else. It's like Henry Kaufman said the other day. He said the people that are going broke in this situation are just two of two types, the ones who knew nothing and the ones that knew everything. And uh, it's, 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 it's sad in a way. I urge you in anything, we never basically borrow money. I mean, we, we get flow through our insurance business and do things, but I, I never borrowed money. I never borrowed money when I had 10,000 bucks, basically, because what difference did it make? I was having fun as I went along, and it didn't make any difference whether I had $10,000 or a million dollars or $10 million, uh, you know, except if I had a medical emergency or something had come along like that. But I was going to do the same things when I had a lot of money as when I had very little money. You know, there, if you think about the difference between me and you in terms of how we live, you know, we wear the, we wear the same clothes, basically. SunTrust gives me mine, but you... <laughs> <laughs> what? We, so we wear the same clothes. We, 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 eat, you know, we, we all have a chance to drink the juice of the gods here. <laughs> yeah. But we, we all go to McDonald's, or better yet, Dairy Queen, and uh, uh, and we we live in a house that's 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 warm in winter and cool in summer, and and, and we watch uh, Nebraska, Texas, they had them on a big screen. You know, you you see it the same way I see it. We do everything. Our lives aren't that different, you know. If, if, You'll, you'll get decent medical care if something happens to you, and I'll get decent medical care. The only thing we do is we travel differently. You know, I ride around this little plane, and I love it. <laughs> you know, and that takes money. But if you leave, if you leave that aside, if you leave that, aside, we travel differently. But other than travel, you know, I would I think about it. Think, what, what can I do that you can't do? Now I get to work in a job that I love, but I've always worked in a job I love. I love it when I, I loved it just as much when I. Well, you know, when it was a big deal, if I made a thousand bucks, and I urge you to work in jobs you love. I mean, I think you're out of your mind if you take keep taking jobs that you don't like because you think it'll look good on your resume. I was with a fellow at Harvard the other day who was taking me over to talk, and he was 28, and he was telling me all about what he'd done in life, and which was terrific. And and then I said, "What are you going to do next?" And he said, "Well," he said after I get out my my uh, MBA, he says, "I think maybe I ought to go to work for a management consulting firm because." To look good on my resume. And I said, wait a second, you've been 28, you've been doing all these things. I mean, you've got a resume that's 10 times as good as anybody I've ever seen it already. I said, if you take another job you don't like, just for you, I said, isn't that a little like saving up sex for your old age? You know, I mean, <laughs> there comes a time when you ought to just start doing what, you know. You, you ever got, <laughs> so, 